Sure. I'm Craig Keefe. I'm Deputy Director at the Research Center called COSMIAC at the University of New Mexico. Uh, we do aerospace and defense applications, and this is our senior engineer, Brian Zufeld. He's also at COSMIAC, and he does aerospace and defense applications with cutting-edge technology. Right now, you have a variety of older components that are trying to reduce risk. So, the small spacecraft community is, uh, or CubeSats, are able to leverage that risk because of the co low cost of the satellite. And so we're able to see what is in the open source community as well as uh, in the space community and use what is best for the application. Uh, perfect example on big satellites that are going to geosynchronous orbit, they're gonna have to deal with radiation. They're gonna have to deal with uh, a very harsh environment. Our current commercial COTS uh, components off the shelf are not gonna survive that environment. However, CubeSats are able to be that disruptive technology that's able to use what is best, uh, put a ton of power in there. Um, before, you're, you're limited to a 8051 processor by Aeroflex, designed a long time ago. Uh, but it's rat hard, and it has flight heritage. Uh, so if you're building a multi-million dollar spacecraft, you're not gonna leverage it off of a $10 microcontroller. You're gonna have to use that uh, tens of thousand dollars for a microcontroller that gives you that reliability. But if your spacecraft costs 50,000, 100,000, um, you're able to launch multiple of them and for a million dollar budget, then you can start using uh, those low cost components. And so, and temperature at a low earth orbit is not gonna be terrible. And so you're starting to see the bigger guys start looking at different kind of processing architectures. Perfect example, uh, Silicon Space Technologies now has a rad hard arm that uh, uses all the latest tools and debuggers that are out there. So the differences between a rad hard processor and a non-rad hard or a commercial processor is you have to deal with radiation, you have to deal with high temperature. So part of the process in which they make the processor changes. Um, part of the design of the processor itself, all the registers have to be triple redundancy added so that they can use a voting scheme. This is all abstracted from the programmer and the designer, so if you're using a rad hard arm and you're sticking with a SimSys compliant software, it doesn't matter what you're programming on. You can program on the, say, M0, uh, ARM Cortex M0, and then your code will port to the new ARM. So it's really about the hardware itself doesn't affect the software. It is a special ARM chip that you would buy from Silicon Space. They do license the ARM from the ARM company um, and then add their own manufacturing process. So. Uh, to go on to what Brian was saying, it, the commercial ARM products are magnificent for what they do. They're low cost, they're, they're efficient, but in space radiation just kills electronics. And, and so it kills it in two ways. One is through a total dose effect, and the other is through upsets. And so what's happened is the federal government has realized that their radiation hardened inventory is decades old. And so what they're doing now is they're spending the money to create radiation hardened versions of cutting edge technology. And ARM's a fantastic platform for doing that. It's just an amazing chip where you can use modern debugging tools. So you can take somebody fresh out of college that's already learned on the new tools and use that to create flight articles. So, so a red hard chip can run you, depending on how it's qualified, um, anywhere between $5,000, $10,000 per chip. Um, and then there's engineering models that don't go through the qualification so that uh, you can just do your development with it. But a flight article, they'll want you to go through qualification. Yeah, but what you really want to try to do is find a way to not have to do it. Yes. That, that's the beauty. NASA now has all these programs where they're launching these small satellites out of the International Space Station. So at that point, what they do is they just open the door, give a boot, kick the thing out. Since it's going up lower than the ISS, you end up with a couple months, maybe six months worth of life. So at that point, you can use this bleeding edge technology and test things like that radiation hardened arm before you need it in a real harsh environment like the moon. The uh, systems that we developed for allowing us to use commercial parts, um, one, it should be mentioned that if you're not in a high radiation area, like in a low earth orbit, 
a lot of the effects that you would see in radiation can be mitigated by either power cycling the board, so using watchdog timers to constantly reboot the board, um, yeah. storing all your data in a non-volatile location like Flash, reboot it. Um, you can also start doing memory scrubbing, uh, other effects in software that would allow you to mitigate those radiation effects. So because of that, you can use Raspberry Pi, you can use uh, BeagleBone Black. Um, these boards, before the do-it-yourself community uh, came out, were expensive, horribly expensive. Now you have every engineer can afford enough computing power for less than a hundred bucks to rival the biggest of satellites. So what we're doing is we're designing a way to rapidly integrate this new cutting edge technology into spacecraft. So what we've done is we've, we're working with a group down at the University of Texas El Paso's Keck Center and Youngstown State University out in Ohio to create a satellite that will fly cutting edge technology. And, and so what we did is we looked at it and said, we already know how to 3D print a wiring backplane. So what we're gonna do is Brian has created a design that's a tray. And all it really is, is a, you give people these SolidWorks files and you say, here, tweak the files as you need to allow you to put a Raspberry Pi in there or a BeagleBone Black or a SparkFun EPS or a SparkFun battery pack. And then they slide it in. We then slide it into the satellite, close the lid, and fly it. I like that. I, it's also designed to be one of those disruptive technologies. Um, people would see it as a very high risk mission. You're flying the stuff that's meant for development on the ground, you're flying stuff that's not ever intended for space. But let's see, the cost is right. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's yeah. see what we learn uh, yeah. from doing that. That's the thing, if you can do something for under $10,000, Nobody in the aerospace industry even looks at it. They don't even blink about it. And a lot of these satellites that we can build, we can build for hundreds of dollars. And then NASA is going to launch it for us for free because we're academia. So it's a great, great win-win situation for everybody. For satellite launches, if we are using commercial components, there is some care that we need to add to the board. Uh, one is conformal coding. Uh, the problem that exists is Every commercial component, they want to use lead-free solder. And so 10 solder will tend to create what's called 10 whiskers in a vacuum environment. Conformal coating can mitigate that, especially in a six-month mission. And the other things like with the, the circuit boards, the memory cards, where you just push the memory card and it pops out, bad, <laughs> bad in space. Really not a great feature. So you generally have to take that off and then you just solder the memory card down or. 20 epoxy it down. The, the other is high items like ethernet connectors. Anything that's really tall is gonna flop off of there. So we tend to take those off or else just use this two-part epoxy that will keep it on there until the end of time. Before we take a satellite and fly it, the pro <laughs> our little satellites are never the main reason that the big rocket is going up. The, the little satellites are the parasite that goes along and so what happens is before you get into orbit, you have to prove to the big rocket provider that you're not going to fall apart and destroy them. And so what we do is we do a thing called shake and bake. So what we do is we take the satellite, we put it into a dispenser, we put the dispenser on a vibrational table, and we vibe it in each of the three axes to make sure that it's not going to fall apart. Next, we take it and we put it in an oven take it to 60 C for 10 to the minus six tor for six hours and do what's called outgassing or baking. Because what happens is if I go to Radio Shack or Home Depot buy wire, common wire or hose and put it into that chamber at 10 to the minus six tor for 60 C for six hours, it becomes dust. All the moisture comes right out of it. So what we've got to do is make sure that before we fly anything, that because that that outgassing is really moisture coming off the electric off, off of the plastics, and if you're in that satellite next to a hundred million dollar imaging satellite, then at that point it, it's a terrible experience for the other guy. So that that's what we do. We call it shake and bake before we deliver. We had uh, NASA Ames approach us and say, 
look, you, you guys have done some real cutting edge stuff in the last two years. It, is there some way we can take this to the next level? Can you actually print and deliver a CubeSat? Something that's about the size of a bread box that's fully certified for space, that contains cutting edge technology, that contains boards that were made in less than a year ago. And, and that's unheard of in the space community. And we said, yeah, we'll take on the challenge because the maker community has created a capability for us to do some really cool, cool stuff. So what we're looking at then is Brian has come up with a design for a, a satellite that will allow us to reach out to the maker community. And, and we're actually looking to our friends and saying, look, have you got a board and a project that you want to fly on this? And they say, yes, we give them the SolidWorks files for the caddy or the tray they then print their own tray, polycarbonate, give it to us. We mount it into the system and fly it. We'd like to get that certified and flown within the next year. So we have 2U uh, standard Arduino board, uh, Raspberry Pi, BeagleBone Black. Uh, we do also like what TI has offered in their launch pad, their Tiva uh, collection. So that is that is our current plan plus EPS. What do you think? Six or eight boards? Yeah. Yeah, because yeah. what happens is at the at its basic concept, 3D printing is nothing more than taking, adding a layer, lowering a plate, adding a layer, lowering a plate, adding a layer, lowering a plate. Where it all changes is when you can stop that process and then change materials and start printing like a dope tungsten for radiation protection and stop and keep printing where you can add electronics, mil, micro machine out and laser weld parts into place and keep printing and then print propulsion systems and keep printing and then print antennas and keep printing so you can print an entire blocked cube and, and that's really the holy grail we're going for but the technology is not quite there yet today uh, i mean it's much easier and faster to do the tray take the tray put the current boards in there and then just fit, make the boards safe for space like Brian was saying, conform will coat them or, or take off the tall parts, take out anything that you can push and have it pop out. And at that point, you can really print the entire satellite. But we're not there today. To get started in a personal space program, what you really want to do is, is find academia. Find someone loped you with a college or a university. NASA has got a program called ILANA, the Educational Launch of Nanosatellites. And they will launch satellites for free for academia. And so what you do is they've actually got a solicitation that just came out and it's going to be out. The proposals are due in about three months. And the key to that is that they will manifest and launch the satellite for you for free. So get with your local academia. Uh, if you have trouble finding one, contact Brian or I and we can help you. <laughs> and NASA is thrilled to find 50 satellites from 50 states. So they are spearheading the effort to try to get those states that haven't launched the satellite yet into that program and then once you get there the key is to just find something that's cool if, if it's not fun you shouldn't be doing it because you're not going to do a good job of it find something like I say what, what, what Brian and I do a lot of our work is with Tiva and, and Launchpad and things of that nature people don't like technology for the sake of technology they like technology that can solve their problems, okay? And so when you can find somebody that says, I really want to know about how much moisture there is at 350 kilometers. You say, well, huh, look, you can get a spark fund board for $50. Here, Brian and Craig will give you the SolidWorks files. All we gotta do is print a tray, put it in there and deliver it. And that's when it starts to change for everybody. If you wanna join the space community, just build a satellite. Right now, it's so cheap to just build a satellite. You have Arduino boards, you have GrabCAD, provides a lot of SolidWorks models, STL models you can import right into uh, MakerWare and start printing your own cube. Therefore, you're working on form factor of a CubeSat. You'll have all the hardware, Arduino, uh, Raspberry Pi. Uh, start seeing solar panels you can get from SparkFun or online. If you have a concept for a mission, build the satellite, see what doesn't work, post your designs. You saw a lot of uh, people here were talking about open source. That's really a new buzzword in this community now is open source. They're starting yep. to see the benefits of 
why am I building a power system every single time when so-and-so is building a power system? Build your satellite, get it out to the community, and if there's if we need to tweak it, we'll tweak it. Yeah. And then we can work together to build a open source satellite.